Question four. Deglin says that blank disrupts the demon's magic. What is it? Toss a coin to your wish. Meteorite steel powder. It, it was meteorite. <laughs> We're just going to forget the rest. Oh, okay. That's... <laughs> it's meteorite ore. It's meteorite ore. It's fine. I'll give it to you. <laughs> or what? Or, or... <laughs> oh, there we go. In with the dad joke. Why, why thank you. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, fine. Point. Peter, you're getting another <laughs> I think beyond bonus content, this is really like audio evidence of our just eventual descent into madness. Um. <laughs> Subscribe now. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair, a global Witcher podcast. My name is Alyssa from Good Morin, and I'll be your host as you, I, and our international Hansa accompany Geralt of Rivia and his destiny, Cirilla of Sintra, across the continent. We're kicking off season four of the podcast, in which we'll discuss all things Netflix, including Nightmare of the Wolf, The Witcher season two, and The Witcher Blood Origin. I hope you all had a lovely break. I know I did. Since the last episode of the podcast, I completed a workout challenge at my local gym, a vocal combat class. I finished an entire level of Spanish lessons and began level three yesterday. I took ballet for the first time in 12 years. We've done table reads for the first four episodes of the upcoming audio drama I'm executive producing and have begun production on episode one. With our resident GM, Gary from Kentucky, we wrapped up our year-long D&D campaigns on the continent and have begun four new campaigns starring 20 players from our international community across the Americas and Europe. Together, the Hansas spent many hours over the break watching 17 Christmas films and 2000s rom-coms, including, but not limited to, A Cinderella Story, A Cinderella Story, Christmas Wish, The Princess Switch Trilogy in Reverse Chronological Order, What a Girl Wants, 10 Things I Hate About You, High School Musical 1 and 2, Little Italy, The Royal Treatment, Night at the Museum, She's the Man, Miss Congeniality, along with An Audience with Adele, Kid Nation, and Junior Bake Off 2022. Other things that have happened since last season, Spotify has added the ability to rate podcasts on their platform. Now you can rate and review Breakfast in Beauclair on Spotify in addition to Apple Podcasts and Facebook. Ratings and reviews encourage potential listeners to give the show a chance. So if you've enjoyed the last three seasons of the podcast, be sure to rate it on your listening app of choice and tell your friends and family. This might not really come as a surprise, but due to current restrictions and medical recommendations, we'll be postponing our international meetup in Edinburgh this April. However, if you are local to London or willing to travel, some members of our community will be having a small meetup in two weeks on Saturday, February 19th. For more details about the meetup and to connect with members of our community, visit the Hansa Discord. Over the break, we had a number of patrons join the show on Patreon. This episode, we welcome Jessica from Kentucky, Shriknosa, Aaron from the U.S., Matt from Liverpool, Softy, and Miriam from Germany, along with new producer-level patrons, Silo Saib Sorcerer, Trevor from the U.S., and Roxas, who join our existing producer-level patrons, Louise of Covier, the owner of the Churlish Porpoise, Katie the Redhead of Toussaint, Jacob B., Ava of Gullet, B. Haven of the Edge of the World, Charlotte from Vengerberg Glamorai, Red Kite, the Original Roach, Codringer's Cat, Libby, Claire O'Dell, Genity Mundilovich, Wolf, Corey from the US, John of Riblia, Tom from Australia, Jill Kate the Tabby Witch, Ollie from Sweden, James Carson III, and Kyle the H2 Ho. This episode's cold open is a clip from our new pub quiz show, The Quiz of Surprise, which is exclusive to patrons of Breakfast in Beauclair. In The Quiz of Surprise, guests of the show go head to head in trivia about the content we literally just discussed. I had so much fun with Rob and Piotr recording the first one. If you'd like to hear the full 20-minute episode and learn more about becoming a patron of the show, visit patreon.com slash breakfast in Beauclair. As for this episode, Rob the Undead Gamer and Piotr from Witcher School call in for a discussion of Netflix's anime spin-off film, Nightmare of the Wolf. Join us as we discuss The Witcher in animation, Station, and the desire for something more changes from the existing lore, narrative storytelling in VR, Witcher Monster Slayer from Spocko and CD Projekt Red, LARP 101, an introduction to LARP with Witcher School in Poland, Puppies of Surprise, and Sikowski, verbatim. 
In our mid-episode news segment, Tidings from Tucson, Larson Witcher Flicks shares updates from The Witcher Season 2, The Witcher Season 3, The Witcher Blood Origin, and Netflix's next anime film. After the break, don't miss the new listener call-in segment with members of our international community. Without further ado, let's get to our discussion of Netflix's Nightmare of the Wolf, Part 1. Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair. My name is Alyssa, and I'm so pleased to open Season 4 of the podcast with my guest today. My first guest is an actor, performer, gamer, and streamer who you'll recognize from Episodes 25 and 26 of Breakfast in Beauclair, covering rare species from Season 1 of Netflix's The Witcher. He LARPs with the UK-based Northern Kingdom system as Balder, a bear school witcher. Please welcome back Rob the Undead Gamer. Hey, Rob. Hey, thank you so much for having me back. Yes, I'm so excited (laughs) to have you here as well. My second guest is a game designer from Poland specializing in narrative who uses his talents at both a game dev company and is one of the organizers and main writers for the Witcher School LARP. Please welcome Piotr from Witcher School. Hey, Piotr. Hello. Well, it is so lovely to have you both here for the opening of season four of Breakfast in Beauclair. I can't believe we are starting this season. The Witcher season two just came out in the last few days. Um, So we're sitting down to record Nightmare of the Wolf, the anime which came out in August. But before we get to that, I'd love to hear more about both of you. Uh, Rob, you were a guest in July 2020, so like a year and a half ago. And I think that episode came out around like October or so. But what has been you with you since then? I know we've been in COVID, so that <laughs> yes, COVID was is still a thing. Um, but my my life uh, took a big, big change towards the end of last year. So I've had a lot of lot of things change in my personal life, which I've had to deal with, um, which have been really tough. But I've taken the time with like a lot of support with my friends and family, and you know, got my life so back on track with things, and um, I've just sort of really taken a lot of time for myself, honestly. So the the sort of acting stuff has kind of been put on hold a little bit. I mean, COVID did that anyway, but yeah, just uh, focusing on on me a little bit um, has been has been necessary. Um, but you know, aside from that, still been um, gaming and streaming and all that sort of thing, which you know keeps those creative juices flowing um, a little bit. And um, in the UK this year, we were able to get back to, to doing a little bit of LARPing, um, which has been great. So um, it's been nice to sort of get back in the field and get my Witcher on again, uh, which has been fun. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's been good taking time for myself and uh, mental health as well, which has been really important. You know, anyone who's going through a hard time, like, it's okay. Look after yourself. You need to. It's very important. One of the other ways I think you've continued to play, I know that you're gaming as well, but we're both friends on Witcher Monster Slayer. (laughs) And I do know (laughs) that you also play on there as Balder. I think I named, I actually forget what I named my Witcher. Jarek, I think it was. Yarek, yeah. Yeah. Yarek is super hot. (laughs) It's always really fun to like go through my friends list and see like, oh, Balder, that's, that's Rob. And I'll send you a little gift. Love it. What's something that you've encountered that you've been surprised with in Witcher Monster Slayer that you would or wouldn't like to meet in person? Oh, man, too many things. There's been things on there that obviously haven't been in the games previously, which has been nice. So they've clearly been, you know, slightly expanding the, you know, the, the, the bestiary and things like that. But I actually encountered this the other day and it terrified me to my core as myself and then just would be something that, yeah, as a witcher, I would not want to tangle with. And it was like a thunder, thunderstorm or something like that. It was essentially like the were-rat variant, but it basically looked like Pikachu from Pokemon and I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. Pikachu's my favorite Pokemon and like CDPR, you've done him dirty. Like he's, he's there as a little yellow rat. He's got like a thundery little mustache and that like crinkled tail. It's terrifying. No, thank you. On that note, Piotr, so you work for a game dev company in Poland. Uh, What kind of games do you work on? What kind of worlds do you like to immerse yourself in as a writer? I have just started, to be honest. Uh, I've started three months ago. So the company I work for is called Carbon, and we mainly specialize in VR games. Our latest title is uh, Warhammer Age of Sigma Tempest Fall. So a big IP as well. And that's, that's cool. That's really awesome to be a part of it. I mean, I, when I joined, uh, the game was newly, just before, you know, it was released. So I didn't really do anything <laughs> with the main game. Uh, but we're currently doing something, some uh, add-ons and so on, working on that. So that's, that's really cool to be a part of that. So, yeah, mostly some, you know, fantasy universes for me. But I am, um, you know, all-around nerd. 
everything really, really works for me. I love cyberpunk. I love uh, science fiction. Recently, I got really into, I don't know if you know this tabletop RPG by Free League called uh, Basim. It's a Nordic horror RPG, and this is bonkers how good it is. <laughs> and I'm not really into horror, so I was surprised that, that it really got my attention, but it's great, so yeah. You mentioned uh, that you're working mostly in VR now. Does the medium of VR affect the way that you tell stories? Like, what have you learned about creating content for that kind of world and, and experience? Well, I am just getting into it, really, because before I started working for Carbon, I didn't really play anything for the uh, <laughs> medium. But uh, it is really different because um, the whole game is real-life action. You cannot really add any cutscenes. You cannot tell the player, OK, now look here and we'll just show you something because the player has to move their head and see what's happening. So it's really fun to uh, create, for example, you know, important events in a game. Like, I don't know, someone you love is dying just next to you. But if you are looking over there, you don't see them dying, just hear them, you know, coughing blood. And uh, so you somehow have to take this into consideration as well. But this is more for the um, level design department, I believe, just to make things in such a way that the player's attention will be drawn to important things. As for the storytelling, well, yeah, it also influences it because you cannot tell things via cutscenes. So you have to somehow get over it and get around it to, you know, to just um, tell what you want to tell, but in such a way that fits the medium. And it, it's, a, it's challenging, it's really challenging, but it's also fun. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's great. That's super interesting. That's not something I would have ever thought about, just like the lack of cutscenes or like contained storytelling. Because I know if I had to sit in a video game and someone was kicking it beside me, I would straight up walk the heck out of that room. I mean, to <laughs> me, it was a rather new experience as well, because I remember that the, one of the first writing tasks I got when I got the job was to create some scene and I wrote it and, you know, dialed everything. And uh, a coworker who was checking it for me and giving feedback, he was like, that's great, but, and then he told me that, for example, things I planned, they would work really nice in a cutscene, mm. but in a VR game, they wouldn't work at all. So I had to rewrite the whole thing from the beginning. That was fun as well. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I think the one other thing that I want to dive into with both of you is the fact that both of you are involved in LARPing with the Witcher School in Poland, as well as with the Northern Kingdoms in the UK. So could you both tell me a little bit about how you personally got into LARP and um, what your experience has been with both of those systems? I got into LARP like well over 10 years ago, way before I was even like into the Witcher. Like my first sort of like fantasy love was Lord of the Rings you know, being obsessed with that and fantasy in general and then thinking, damn, people actually go and do that of a weekend, dress up and hit each other with swords and stuff. Like, that sounds like the dopest thing. So, you know, found out where I could do it locally and started. And it wasn't until like 2019 or 2018, in fact, I think there was um, rumours of a Witcher LARP starting in the UK and in 2019 it happened, run by a guy called um, Simon Deacon here in, in, in the UK and it's you know, become the Northern Kingdom's LARP, which is, you know, obviously the UK's first official Witcher LARP, which is really cool. And I got lucky enough to play a Witcher in that. It's about the Northern Kingdoms fighting the Third Nilfgaardian War is kind of the premise of the, the whole system and the whole LARP. There are limited sort of player numbers for, for Witchers because we're quite rare at this sort of stage in the sort of timeline and that sort of thing. So majority of people just play, you know, everyday people, everyday soldiers or mages or what have you. It's awesome. Glad to have done, you know, two more events of it this year um, after COVID and everything. Yeah, I just love diving into that world, um, even more so in like a physical world, like being able to be surrounded in it physically rather than it just being on your TV screen or computer screen. You, you know, just feel fully immersed um, in in this world that I've been loving for the last, you know, like, I don't know five or more years um, with the books and the video games and everything and yeah just feeling like you're a part of it um, even more so is just fantastic and I think it's just something in general that LOP does and LOP gives to you with the role play and the immersion and everything and it's just yeah just fantastic. To me it's very similar with Rob. I've LARPed for a little bit longer because I've LARPed for like 20 years now but I started when I was like 10 or 11 maybe so yeah it's, it has been a while. Then I had like three or four years of, of a break because I moved from Poland. I lived in Taiwan for a spell, so not a big laughing community then back there. But when I returned to Poland, my friend was like, dude, 
I know that we have Witcher and there's this Witcher school thing going on and they are looking for NPCs right now. So maybe you can just uh, try to join it. And I almost didn't really submit for the NPC role because I was like, nah, they will not take me. They did take me. And so the uh, adventure started from that point on. First, it was being just an NPC. Then I joined the uh, character sheet writer's team. Then uh, at some point, uh, they're looking for someone to become a coordinator of the lab. So I was like, I can, I can do it. <laughs> and it has been four years now, almost four years now. Wow. And it's, it's awesome. I mean, the greatest thing about it is that I've met so many people from around the world. Lovely people, great people from the UK, uh, from the US, uh, everywhere, really. Uh, and this is what really, really gives me um, the hype. <laughs> to continue on doing this thing. Uh, as for LARPing itself, I love it. So just like Rob said, this is, you know, you getting into a whole new universe in which you can really immerse yourself. It's not like reading a book or a movie or even playing a game, which is more immersive than those two other mediums. But um, but yeah, you are the hero, right? You are in, inside the world and this is really awesome. Lately, I really got into the acting challenge. So... What I love about LARPing right now, to me, the, the biggest thing is that I can play someone that is not me. Because for many, many years, I played a character who was, you know, the, the person wasn't me, but they did have a lot of my, of my traits. Yeah. Nowadays, I try to just, you know, do something very different. So, for example, nowadays, I really enjoy playing villains. As it turns out, I have a talent for it, and uh, that's great. <laughs> Maybe it also tells me something about myself, but uh, it's very challenging. But also when, you know, when other players come to you and they tell you, dude, I was really afraid of you, or uh, you really impressed me with doing something, then you feel like, all right, job well done. Great. So I've got two more questions, one for each of you. So around this time last year, the Hansa started getting into Dungeons and Dragons and getting into character creation and all that stuff. So when it actually comes to character creation for LARP, however, Rob, could you tell us a little bit about how you developed Baldur to start with and how he's developed over the course of, you know, several LARPing events? Yeah, absolutely. So I was kind of cut between doing like um, either a wolf school witcher or a bear school witcher. And uh, my friends at the time were kind of like, well, maybe do a bear school because otherwise you might accidentally fall into some like geralt tropes. And I really didn't want to do that because I wanted to make my own character in person. You know, I was trying my best to sort of like work out, well, OK, maybe this is what they uh, they believe in or that their own sort of witch's code and all this sort of thing, as we know from the books, is something that kind of steers Geralt's morals and that sort of thing and so what was Balder's own Witcher code and running around a few ideas in my head and that sort of thing but I think it's something which is I think the testament to life you can't really fully decide or cement things until you're actually on the field and you're doing them because things can just change sometimes and experiences can just change you um so as long as you're sort of willing to be flexible a little bit with that and let your character sort of grow naturally due to those experiences or your characters essentially lived experiences um which sounds really weird to say but yeah that sort of lets you steer them i think i don't know i mean it's also just fun to just play a grumpy arsehole witcher right like it's just <laughs> it's just fun but i think one thing i've realized is um or which is quite challenging for me as a person is playing social situations a little bit weirdly um knowing that yeah this guy that i'm playing is like 50 something years old and for most of his life just been on his own so he doesn't quite know how to sort of really talk to people well like he'll start a conversation but then not know how to sort of carry it on or he'll say something and everyone's like okay cool and wait for you to carry on but it's like no that was a statement i've said yeah and they're like well, <laughs> things like that are quite fun to sort of play with right and then you've just got to be like you know straight face like uh witcher you know right frowning <laughs> <laughs> just like uh, walk away it's uh it's challenging and, and, and really fun yeah i think it's time to get you a child surprise in your next arc to open you up please a no bit. <laughs> um <laughs> You don't need a small infant or confused dog? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a dog. I'll take the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I guess, Piotr, Witcher School, it's something that I've personally always wanted to go to and I've always wanted to explore. Same. 
Oh, please do. Please do. Both of you. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys had like a huge boom in press like earlier this summer and fall because people were like hyped about, you know, The Witcher Season 2 and Nightmare of the Wolf. And you guys got a lot of press around it, which was awesome. For people in the community who may have never been to Witcher School and would like to in the future, what introductory tips might you have for them when it comes to experiencing LARP for the very first time? Don't be afraid to come. I mean, uh, because we get a lot of people, like really a lot of people who never loved before. Because the whole game is designed just for them. I, what I mean by it is that in the price of the ticket, which can be steep, and we, we agree on that. But in the price, you get not only you know the castle to use, mm -hmm. uh, the whole staff of people who are just there to help you out, uh, because the NPCs are there for you. Even if you are a person who's new to LARPing and who is not very active, because some people, they tend to you know just become watchers rather than active players. Our team is there to, you know, when someone sees you, you know, sitting by yourself, maybe being bored by the whole thing because you're just, you know, watching and doing nothing else. Uh, there will be someone who will come to you and, you know, just sit by you and say, friend, let's talk. And they will just try to bring you into the fun. Yeah. We also give the players uh, a costume. They receive a character sheet in which uh, there are some things listed on, you know, what you can do during the games that fits your character. So, for example, I don't know, you're a spy or something like that, you would give something like, maybe you should, you know, try to find someone powerful and get into their good side so they will help you in the future. So some tips on how to, you know, do some meaningful things during, during the game. My advice to people who never loved and who would like to come to Witcher School is just read all the documents you receive. <laughs> <laughs> because we have some uh, guides prepared as well for people just, you know, explaining everything. So how you're supposed to play the game, uh, what are the do's and don'ts and so on. And that's it, really. Don't have to do nothing other than just to come to the castle. And when the adventure starts, hopefully you will get immersed very quickly. Especially that we put uh, the players into groups. So there will always be someone in a group who is an experienced lover. Mm. Those people tend to, because our community is awesome in that way, that those more experienced veterans and so on, they mostly really are good in helping other people to get into the game. So this is like really cool that... You are not on your own. I think that's one of the best and beautiful things about the LARP community in general is that, like you said, at every LARP, there's always going to be someone who's there, like a veteran, as it were, or someone who's more experienced. As a new player, you just gotta, you just got to throw yourself in as best you can. You can be as prepared as you want to be, but it can be quite weird when you're there um, because it's a bit much sometimes. But that's a testament to like, you know, the veteran players or the experienced players and, and the crew to be like, hey, come, come on, like, you know, come come join the fun. You OK? And, and engage with those players and give them their, you know, confidence as they go and let them know, hey, this is this is awesome. Do you want to come and do a thing or whatever it is? And yeah, that's just how you, this community just continues to grow. And yeah, it's great. Yeah, I love that so much. It sounds like such a special and interesting experience. And I'm so excited at the prospect of like, hopefully trekking out to Poland one day and coming to see some of the beautiful architecture uh, that's there and hang out and to experience Witcher School as both a player and as like a quote unquote, like, I don't want to say journalist, that feels weird, podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> but please do. Uh, yeah. Let me say, I invite you. Just come here and, and, and yes, and also you will come to Wrocław, which is uh, the city from most players will, you know, get to the castle from because the airport is here and so on. And it's a beautiful city as well. Mm. So, you know, if you come, and please do, just remember to, you know, get a few more days off to just do some sightseeing because the city is awesome. Today, we'll discuss Nightmare of the Wolf, the original anime film from Netflix that follows Geralt's father figure, Vesemir, from his childhood through the fall of Kaer Morhen. In the opening scene, a small noble family gets lost in the forest and is slaughtered by a leshen. Only a boy, Sugo, survives and is saved by a witcher, Vesemir. So this opening scene starts out like you see the moonlight, you hear like this creepy little boy voice, which is a very beautiful voice, I'll admit. It's got its own kind of like level of horror where 
He's singing and the carriage stops. He gets reprimanded by his father. And then all of a sudden, his father just has a root coming out of his face. And there's blood everywhere. His sisters die. He's running through the forest. And after this scene, I full on had to stop the movie and just walk away for maybe like five minutes, come back and then just continue the rest of the scene. Those horror elements like continually freak me out throughout the entire movie, which is the only reason why I've only been able to watch this movie twice. It got real, really quick. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. the first couple of minutes of that film. Like, it was not holding punches, <laughs> like, at all. Um, yeah. As Rob said, uh, things go really <laughs> real <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> the thing I really like about the whole movie, to be honest, is that it really draws from anime aesthetics. Mm. They're not shy about it. Because, for example, in this very scene when the Leshen just tears up everyone, blood is everywhere. You know, so anime, like, you know, that it's almost too much. <laughs> yeah. Because many people, uh, after they watched the movie, the friends I talked to, they said, oh, it was okay, but I didn't like the anime aesthetics. And I'm like, dude, but it is it is what it's supposed to be. And they weren't shy about it. They were really consistent about the aesthetics of the whole thing. So I love it, to be honest. And it immediately told you, okay, this is what you're in for. This is what you will be getting from this thing. You're either in or not. So it's your choice right now. This was really good to me. Yeah, 100%. Like, it throws you in straight away. Tells you exactly what you need to expect with, like, the level of gore. But also, <laughs> you're right, it's that sort of stylized anime gore. Um, and that goes right the way through to, like, the extremely stylized sign usage where mm-hmm. um, Vesemi uses Ard and it's just, like, you know, crashing out through the forest and that sort of thing. Um, totally overdone, but, like, so, so cool. Just within the realms of the style. I don't know, I think in general, I'll probably repeat myself a lot, but I think that sort of anime style really fits the Witcher world as well quite a lot. It's nice that they kind of went balls to the wall with it and was like, we're making an anime film and that's what you're going to get. Um, so jump on. Yeah. The lullaby at the start or the little song, it really was, for me, reminiscent of the uh, lullaby of woe from The Witcher 3, yes. um, which I thought was cool. You know, getting that creepy atmosphere and a, a song that just sort of fits the world and the aesthetic. And yeah, then all of a sudden there's that boom, that horror and gore and everything. And the Leshen design as well was really interesting. So again, another thing that I think was a strong thing from this film was the monster designs. We'll probably talk about them later. They're all very unique and very different, even from the TV series, which I think was, you know, good. You know, you know, just ma- makes it its own thing, which was cool. I think when it comes to animation in general, you know, Studio Mirror, the studio that did Nightmare of the Wolf, was also the same studio that did Legend of Korra um, and a number of other very popular shows as well. But I think the comparison that's easily made between, you know, Nightmare of the Wolf and shows like Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra is that animation is almost like this filter that kind of suspends your disbelief (laughs) when it comes to like humans being able to do these things. I think the struggle with live action supernatural shows across television, Marvel, The Witcher, etc., is sometimes when it is live action, the CGI is sometimes distracting. But when you have that glazy filter of animation, you just kind of take everything and you're just like, yeah, it's totally believable that this lushing can turn into an army of bats. And like, yeah, I can believe that. I think it makes the experience of watching these so much more immersive. Um, And as you said, Rob, I think that animation and anime, as you said, Peter, lends itself really nicely to the world of The Witcher. Yeah, 100%. As Rob said, the design of the monster is really cool. And what I loved about it is that they were like, we are doing our own thing. Because we know Alessian is a very, very popular monster from the Witch universe. Mm-hmm. And it conjures up the same image to everyone who played the game. So, you know, this wooden thing with the skull and everything. And they did something very different from that. And I love it. They were like, we are trying to imitate uh, the image that, uh, you know, of the monster from Witcher 3 from the games. Uh, a very different thing, still something that fits the idea. So that was really cool, I think. And there's a little bit of information that we get about witchers in general just from this fight scene alone. So we're able to see the tools that Vesemir uses. So he has like this chain, which is pretty new to at least what we've seen in the Netflix series and even in the games. Potions, his signs, which we get to see used throughout the fight using a chain. 
that, again, set the standard for what to expect for the rest of the film. The other thing that kind of comes up, and we couldn't have known this, you know, six months ago when the film came out, um, is that Vesemir kills the Leshen by covering his sword in oil and then lighting it on fire, uh, which, as we found out two days ago, is the same thing that Geralt does in episode two, Kaer Morin. Oh, no, don't spoil it. I, I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen oh, it? No. Okay, well, I'm not going to say more than that. I'm not going to say more no, than that. No, everyone, that, no, but to be honest, uh, that's fine. I mean, I'm... Yep, that's fine. Oh, no. (laughs) Well, so this is technically a spoiler-free show, but this episode is coming out in February, so I assume that you'll be done with it by then. Yeah, probably (laughs) even I will (laughs) watch it, but so far I have seen only the first episode because I didn't have the time to get into it, so... uh... Sorry. That's totally fine. You're busy recording a podcast right now. Exactly. You're going to get to it eventually. <laughs> but it is pretty cool to see that even something that they must have developed, you know, a year, two years ago is consistent between the anime film and the Netflix series. It's almost giving it a bit more like continuity yeah. in certain aspects, which is really cool. Even though they've, you know, been very brave to be like, we're doing our own thing with this, um, it's still very much a part of the Netflix Witcherverse, if you want to give it an overall cover or whatever, or blanket. Right. Um, although it's still sort of very on its own, it still very much feeds into those continuity aspects, which I think is very cool. Mm-hmm. One of the last things we get in this opening scene as well, we start to hint at the mystery and the plot of the film. Sugo says to Vesmir, I thought you said that they, as in the Leshen, didn't speak. Vesmir responds, they don't. So there's already something about this whole thing that's a little bit bizarre and, again, feeds into that horror theme and that mystery theme that we encounter through the rest of the film. In the next scene, Vesemir loots Sugo's father's body, and the boy talks to a sorceress and tells her how Vesemir abandoned him in the woods. Tetra Gilcrest, a sorceress on Cadewin's council, tries to convince Cadewin's king to exterminate the witchers as a noblewoman, Lady Zerbst, disagrees. That's such a long run-on sentence. Okay, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the next scene that happens starts to add in a lot of the political figures that we'll see throughout the rest of the film and what the overall sentiment is about witchers, which seems to be a little bit perilous and a little precarious at the moment, just because there is now this sorceress, this mage, who is, for some unknown reason, hell-bent on making sure that the witchers are exterminated in Cadewen. But yeah, what did you guys think of this first look into politics in The Witcher? Well, it was all right. Um, we'll get to it when we discuss the ending, because I think the spoiler, I think that the whole mages do what they do in the movie, and that's why witches got eradicated, which is true to the source material, right? But how they got around it, I didn't really like it. But yeah, we'll get into the details later on. But uh, I think that was a really cool foreshadowing to the fact that, in fact, it is a story about the fall of Karen Moran. We see that why, that witches do not have a really great reputation right now, that they do things that are considered uh, immoral. Uh, here we can see that, for example, yes, Vasemir did save the boy, but it's clear that he didn't really give a shit about his fate. He just, you know, he saved the boy just because by chance he was there and he killed the monster, he wanted to get the money. If the boy was not saved, he would be fine with the probably as well. So we can clearly see that the Vesemir, that for example, if you know Vesemir from the books, from the games and so on, you know that this is the young Vesemir. He's a totally different character. There will probably be you know, some story arc behind his uh, character's development and so on. I think that it really nicely foreshadows the whole thing that's going to develop later on. Yeah. Also, like, you know, on top of that introduction with the fight with the Leshen and obviously the throne room or the council, very quickly within like the first five minutes, you're thrown into getting introduced to basically all the movers and shakers for this whole film. Um, And it sets everything up very, very nicely, I think, Um, along with, as has been said, a little bit, a little bit of foreshadowing, um, just sort of, you know, a little subsum on top just to sort of get your teeth into the film doesn't sort of muck about it's you know first five minutes boom here it is here's what we're going for as a viewer makes you sort of sit quite comfortably in okay cool this is what we're down for so let's go yeah yeah and i think as you both said it's like that kind of tease and we'll get to dive into some of the politics at least within cade one itself in the following scene vesmir tells an elf philavandral about his encounter with the leshen Philavandral jumps out the window, deciding to conduct his own investigation into this mystery. 
This is a really cool thing that they were able to do across the live action series and Nightmare of the Wolf is that Phil Evandrel is played by Tom Canton, who's the same actor who plays them in the live action series. That was a really neat thing to like see and just cool for the actor. Like I feel so excited for the actor that they were able to play this character consistently across all of the media. But some of the things that we learn between Philavandrol and Vesemir's dialogue is that the thing that the Leshen had said that stood out to Vesemir at the end, Philavandrol is able to identify it as a language called Elion, which is a dead elven dialect, and translates what the Leshen said to, quote, beware the den of my dead, which is super ominous. We have no idea what that means. <laughs> And Vesemir is so nonchalant, he has his own bath scene, which Netflix has turned into like an hour-long lo-fi video that you can find on YouTube. (laughs) It's high contrast between how nonchalant Vesemir is and how cautious I think Philavandrel is when he says that like girls have been disappearing from the elven ranks uh, and he mentions one elf in particular named Kitsu who was one of the first to vanish and she happened to also speak Elyon Um, and then he jumps out the window. (laughs) Yeah I'll, I'll be honest Alyssa and listeners I wrote my own notes for this as well the only note I've written for this bath scene is in block capitals, it's what the people want. Okay? <laughs> it's all Witcher fans need. It's just a little bit of something in a bathtub. Mm-hmm. That, that's all we want. Um, but yeah, like, you know, <laughs> in all seriousness, um, we're starting to uncover a bit more of that mystery element of this lesson that talks. And I think it shows a lot of um, Vesemir's sort of young... I don't know if naivety is the wrong word or like just cockiness. He just doesn't really care. He's like, he's just in it for the monster and the coins, right? And this is again a running theme that we'll see sort of from Vesemir for the majority of this film um, compared to how, you know, fans of the books or the game sort of know him to be, um, which is quite interesting. It's like, yeah, you know, Phil Evandrel's got this thing that's going on that, you know, he's, he's, oh man, this isn't right. This isn't okay. Also, you know, there's some elven girls that are going missing. He's like, oh, well, whatever. You know, it's just the thing I heard. Anyway, thanks for the coin. See you later. Yeah, it's just starts to add to that mystery and uh, all of these different pieces that are slowly sort of falling before us as a viewer uh, to try and put together, um, which just, again, makes this film um, all the more interesting. And of course, you know, bar scene is what the people want. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, um, nothing to add, to be honest, I mean, the bad scene, yes. <laughs> But uh, speaking of the scene, I think it was the first scene in which I realised how good the dialogues are, because they're really well written, and for example, Vesemir, yeah, he's cocky, he's a selfish son of a gun, but also uh, he's likeable, uh, to me, in this instance. And the dialogue, the delivery is very well done, because this is the point when you will either like the character or not, and I think, yeah, Vesemir is a cool, cool guy, especially later on when he does the Vesemir salute. Cool thing to do. <laughs> and yes, and again, the buff scene. I mean, we get one for every, I think, <laughs> everything set in the Witcher universe, you have to get at least one buff scene. So they've done it here early on, so just get it out of the way. But yeah, really nice. And as you said, it was really nice to see the continuity with Lavander's character. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, and on the subject of dialogue as well, so the writer slash producer who did Nightmare of the Wolf, Bo DeMaio, also did episode three, Betrayer Moon, from season one, as well as episode two, Care Morin, from season two. So he's been working, you know, consistently within all of the media that Netflix has produced. Uh, Although I think he's now stepping away from The Witcher because now he's the showrunner for the upcoming animated uh, X-Men series that's coming out, I believe. Oh, hell yes. Which is like super dope. So yeah, good luck to him with everything moving forward. But yeah, it's been really cool to kind of like have his voice in the media consistently. I mean, mentioning as well, um, being the writers of those two episodes in particular from the the series as well, the dialogue in those are very good. Mm -hmm. Um, There's some very good conversations, not to spoil season two, but like, you know, season one between Geralt and King Foltest, you know, there's so many key points of conversation and dialogue that are just so good in that episode in particular. But yeah, that it tracks. And <laughs> dude, if you're moving on to the X-Men animated series, again, like, I'm so hyped for that. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, we kind of transition uh, after Phil Evandrel, like jumps out the window. He like pulls up his hood and he's just like, I'm out. And then he just like, <laughs> just jumps from the balcony. Just pure Batman in it. <laughs> 
And so Vesemir sits down on the sofa, you know, in his towel and starts to admire the food that's on the table. And there's something there. This is something that's a little bit silly in animation because it's just like a cylinder. And we need the context of the dialogue to tell us like, oh, this is honey cake and it's incredibly meaningful for Vesemir. (laughs) But we'll get to that in a second. So he looks at this like little cake on the table, which triggers a flashback. Before we learn about Vesemir's childhood and life before Kaer Morin, we're going to hand it over to Larson Witcherflix for recent news on the Netflix show. When we come back, Rob, Piotr, and I will continue our discussion of Nightmare of the Wolf. Hey, it's Lars from Witcherflix, and this is Tidings from Toussaint. Welcome back, everybody, for an all-new season. Something ends, something begins. The release of The Witcher Season 2 was over a month ago, and luckily, and we already know that the show is far from being over. A third season, as well as various new spin-off shows and a movie, are already confirmed. Unfortunately, we don't know about any release dates yet. So long months of set leaks and rumors are now awaiting us again. Let us start with the main show. Season 2 of The Witcher has joined Netflix's most viewed TV shows of all time. Currently, Season 2 sits at rank 8 in the list of the most popular TV shows on Netflix with 462 million hours watched, only topped by various seasons of Bridgerton, Stranger Things, 13 Reasons Why, Maid, You and, of course, The Witcher Season 1. But now let's look into the future. As of the end of January 2022, The Witcher production is already preparing for the filming of season 3. At the moment, various production members, like showrunner Lauren Hisrick, are location scouting and posting some beautiful pictures on Instagram. Unfortunately, we do not know where exactly these photos were taken, but it is very likely that they were taken in the area of Long Cross Studios near London, UK. Moreover, we have also learned that the scripts for season 3 are already written, or as Lauren Hisrick said, the creative process is now really just starting. We have the scripts and now we'll bring directors on, the actors back in and really start delving in deeper and reflecting back and making sure that it's the perfect season. She continues, I'm really thrilled with how the season is shaping up because it's based on my favorite book in the saga, which is The Time of Contempt. I feel like season 1 and 2 have been laying the playing field for everything huge that's about to happen. After the adaptation of the first Witcher book in the main saga Blood of Elves, season 3 will now adapt Time of Contempt, the second book in the main saga. In an interview with Collider, Lauren Hisrick also gave some hints about season 3's storyline. We approximately do a book a season, but we also make sure that the stories from that book are best in that season of our television show. So sometimes we move those chess pieces around a little bit. There's a big story from Blood of Elves that we're gonna do in season 3 for instance. Or there was a short story that we couldn't fit in season 1 so we put it in season 2. We try to be pretty flexible with that. Moving on to Blood Origin. The Witcher spin-off miniseries about the age of elves around the times of the conjunction of the spheres. According to Redanian Intelligence, a very special character from the main show will make an appearance in Blood Origin. Our favorite bard Yaskir, played by Joey Beatty, will be in a tavern telling or singing an old tale in front of a big crowd. This tale is supposed to be Blood Origin's storyline. Redanian Intelligence adds that Yaskir will be interrupted by an elf that corrects him and says that Yaskir's songs aren't what actually happened. Classic Yaskir. By the way, if you have watched the final episode of The Witcher main show until the end of the credits, you might have already seen the first teaser trailer for Blood Origin. It includes battle-hardened elven warriors, beautiful set pieces and incredible Icelandic landscapes. But Blood Origin isn't the only Witcher spin-off on Netflix. Beside the anime movie Nightmare of the Wolf that was already released back in August 2021, there are other projects in the making. First, a family-friendly TV series set in the Witcher world. We don't know anything about yet. Second, another anime movie set in the Witcher world. In an interview with Na Ekranje, Witcher executive producer Tomek Baginski talked about this new anime movie. He said, We are at a fairly early stage. I've recently read the first draft. It is based on one of the stories we know from the world of the Witcher. So the source is entirely from Sapkowski's books. But which story I would prefer to keep a secret. This is of course very vague and we can only speculate about the anime movie's storyline. If Netflix asked me about my favorite story to adapt in such a movie, my answer would simply be two words. Falka's Rebellion. 
Anyway guys, that's it for me for today. I hope you all stay safe and well. We'll talk again in the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair. Until then, thanks again for listening and good luck on the path. Hey everyone, this season I'm pleased to share our new listener call-in segment, Dear Friend. Keep on listening as members of our international Hansa share their thoughts on what we're discussing in this episode. Hey, I'm Christian from South Africa and Canada, and I really enjoyed the overall display from Nightmare of the Wolf of what the witches were in their prime, how many they were, how rich they were, how powerful they were, how feared and respected they were, and how needed they were. I thought they did a great job to showcase what it was like back in the day of the first early witches. Hi, my name is Michelle. I live in Mexico. What I loved about Nightmare of the Wolf was how the love interest was an older woman. It's so rare to see that in media in general and cultural productions at large, especially in fantasy, where when women are older, they look much younger. It was nice to see an older woman who looked her age in this. Hi, Hansa. It's Tommy from Australia. Something I think really worked well in Nightmare of the Wolf was the art direction, especially the way colors were used to effectively convey atmosphere. This can be seen in Vesemir's room at the inn where hazy pinks and reds convey a sense of warmth and comfort, or during the exorcism of the mare where the cold blue fires create an unnatural and ephemeral feeling. It can also be seen in the swamp where the sickly green mist portends the imminent doom of the witch's students. Anyway, that's all for me. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks to Christian, Michelle, and Tommy for sending in their thoughts on Nightmare of the Wolf. Hear your voice in a future Dear Friend segment by emailing greetings at breakfastmoclair.com or DMing the podcast on social for more information. Hey everyone, welcome back from the break. When we left off, Vesemir had looked at a honey cake on a table which triggered a flashback about his childhood. In the flashback, we learn about Vesemir's childhood. He was a servant for a lord and lady with a girl named Ileana. After stealing healing herbs and buying honey cake for themselves, they're confronted by a witcher, Deglin, who has heard rumors about an insane noblewoman and demands to be taken to the estate. Vesemir watches as Deglin expels and kills the creature, Amar, which can cause illusions and hallucinations. After meeting Deglin, Vesemir wants to become a witcher to leave his life of servitude and poverty. Eventually, he runs away from home and journeys to Kaer Morhen alone. So this is a very, very detailed flashback, um, and I'm sure it's a lot for us to cover as well. But yeah, we've never really explored the origins of any witcher other than Geralt throughout all of the media. And even then, it's pretty sparse. Like we hear a little bit about Geralt's childhood in something more, but that's really about it. And like a little bit here and there in Blood of Elves, but there's really not much. So it's pretty cool to, as you said, Peter, like focus on one area, like the fall of Kaer Morin and Vesemir as a character, and really flesh out the possibilities for what that journey could have been. Mm, totally agree. They really nicely show us why the adult Vesemir, uh, I mean the, the young adult Vesemir, yeah. <laughs> the old fat <laughs> Vesemir, uh, is like he is because of his childhood, because of his experience. Uh, and of course, we can easily see that Deglan will become a mentor for him. And Deglan's view on the world will be somehow shared by Vesemir. And again, we'll get to the final when we will see that some things were overdone by Deglan. But I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed that it's showing us the, uh, the human side of Vesemir, that he had a childhood, he had a childhood friend, made probably a, a love interest, right? Uh, he had a family. And it also shows us that witches are humans as well, mm-hmm. in a very clear way. That even when he says things like, I don't give a shit, uh, you know, we witches, we don't have emotions, we don't care about such human things as, you know, as, as good and evil, it's not true. We can see that deep inside, he still is this little boy that wants to fulfill some kind of fantasy. To him, this fantasy is to become someone wealthy enough to buy this uh, honey cake every time he wants to do so. so. Yeah, um, I think that, like you said, Alyssa, we get bits from Geralt. Now, and this is quite a big scene, this flashback. So it's nice to really see properly those sort of humble beginnings of Vesemir. But it all makes sense. You know, he's in this life of poverty and servitude. And uh, you get a sense that throughout all of this, he feels like he's born to do more or maybe deserves to do more. Um, And to a degree, I think, resents his father and his station in life and all this sort of thing. Uh, Especially in one of the final scenes of that flashback where just before he leaves, 
you know, he sees his father sort of come back uh, to the hut that they all sleep in and he's like massaging his feet and stuff. And you can tell that it's like the final straw. It's like, I don't end up like him. There's more to life and I'm going to, I'm going to find it. Yeah. And also just, yeah, cool being introduced to Deglan and just more witches in general, um, I think is always a good thing. And I think, you know, as this and even season two, you know, goes on, you know, we'll meet more and more witches. It's just nice to see um that there's more to them and they're all individual and all different personalities they're not all the same you know they're not all like Geralt or what have you so it's just nice to explore more of that profession Mm -hmm. and those types of of people in this world which is really cool and yeah I don't know Deglan sort of comes across um to me as a little bit um I don't know there's something something about him that I'm not sure if you should trust or not sure if you should admire I think but I think maybe that's just a Witcher thing. Um, I don't know. Because he comes across in that alleyway as a little bit... I don't know, it's just something. It's just something. It's just yeah. something. You like, shouldn't be following small children into alleyways yeah. as a full-grown adult. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that as well. <laughs> the yeah. objects. Look at the objects. <laughs> oh, man. We go to the estate and, as you said, we learn that the lady of the house is insane and she's kind of writhing on her bed. She's screaming. She's having these hallucinations. And the lord of the house turns to Vesemir's father. And I didn't put in the whole quote, but one of the things that he says is like, a lesser man would sell your boy just because of how incompetent Vesemir seems in this scenario, which is just such an awful thing for someone to say about you or your child. And for Vesemir to just have to listen to his father be like, yes, sir, you're great, sir. Thank you very much for not selling my boys, sir. It must be so horrifying to watch your father go through this. And that's just the way that you have to live. But after we move on from that scene, we meet Ileana, who is Vesemir's childhood friend. She's adorable. She's got freckles. She's cute. And Vesemir clearly likes her, as we see. Her dream is to have this lake house where she could like picnic and drink wine by the water. And it's a very luxurious dream that she has. Um, And for both of them, that kind of dream, as we said, feels very far off given their station and their lot in life at the moment. Deglin comes to the estate with them and that's where the witchering kind of comes back into the picture. This is a crazy scene and I think again one that is elevated with the use of animation. Deglin starts to like sprinkle a bunch of stuff around the bed. Um, He says meteorite ore disrupts the demon's magic and starts to conduct some sort of ritual to exercise the mar. But Deglin allows Vesemir to stay. There's a number of reasons for this. One, to have a second hand there to catch the creature when it comes out of this woman. Also to kind of give Vesemir a bit of a taste of a life that he could have. Deglin does the ritual. There's a very terrible shot. (laughs) It's very alien-like of this woman vomiting up this creature that pushes out of her stomach and chest. And then I thought it was going to like be a full burster, but it wasn't. Um, And she eventually vomits up this creature which kind of look a bit like a spider and this shapeshifter that when Vesemir tries to kill it it turns into Ileana and then starts crawling on the fucking ceiling and when it goes to jump out the window Deglin throws a dagger and uh, impales it and then he says better dead than fled (laughs) which just feels a little too uh humorous for the moment but it's fine (laughs) but yeah what what did you guys think of this ritual and exorcism so I think weirdly there was a a lot of foreshadowing in this scene, right? Probably get into it a bit more later, so I'm not going to say too much. But like you've got um, Deglan wanting Vesemir to stay. So one year, obviously, get a bit of a taste of the life, as it were. Because also he saw, you know, Vesemir run off with these uh, pieces of fruit or vegetables to distract. So, you know, Deglan can obviously see a little bit of something in him um, that could be potentially good for a, a witcher recruit. But yeah, like catch the mar for me, right? I want it alive if possible. So there's a little bit of foreshadowing there, I think, for for what, you know, ends up happening a little bit later, which is interesting. He wants to capture this creature. We're not told why, but he wants to capture this creature, right? The fact that when Vesemir didn't manage to catch it and was running after this spider thing before it ended up turning into Ileana and sort of messing with his mind a little bit. Um, we're also sort of, you know, seeing that like, uh, or, or Deglin says, you know, don't let it get into your mind or something like that. So, you know, we know that witches can be quite um, resistant to sort of mind effects and uh, seeing illusions, whereas lesser people or humans or what have you can be a little bit more susceptible, um, which again, I think is a little bit of foreshadowing for 
the end one of the final sort of scenes which i will get into when we when we go but that, i know this might just be me being crazy uh with my like calculations and stuff but I, other than that, i thought it was a really really cool scene uh really sort of set of the moods you know really sort of dark gritty scene which was cool and just cool to see like some sort of like ritual or exorcism um which was just a bit different to just a monster fight showing that witches just do a little bit more um than just here's my sword and uh you know fight a thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah that it was it was just cool yeah i don't think you're crazy i think that you're you know on point with it that the foreshadowing thing here is great because if you are watching carefully then you well you'll probably still be surprised uh but you'll be ah right. like it all comes together at the end like yeah <laughs> exactly exactly but two things that i really loved about the whole scene is that first of all we can see Deglan working and we can see that he's a very experienced witcher that to him it's routine because he, you know, he doesn't really investigate. He just comes in and, oh, it's a mark. Okay, so I know what to do. And we can see that he's very smart and cunning. The way in which he treats Vesemir, in which he shows things to him, in which he you know, talks to him, it shows that Deglan knows that a potential recruit who is a volunteer is a much better recruit than someone, you know, just collect uh, from the road and take with you by force to Ken Moran. And we can see that uh, later on it really pays off because Bezenger becomes one of his best adepts, best pupils, right? Because he's driven by the need to become someone more. Yeah, someone who he probably believes that he deserves to become. So this was really nicely done. And what you said, the whole ritual, the whole exorcism was really great to show that the witches do not only slay beasts, but they also have to do some thinking as well, and they have to be pretty knowledgeable to know how to deal uh, with such creatures. And I think the thing that you're both alluding to is just how masterfully self-contained the content is. Like, if you're a fan of the books, you're a fan of the games, you're going to be able to catch things. But anything that you need to know, if you've never seen or heard of anything about The Witcher before, it's a self-contained enough story that you can follow along, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's just the testament to the writing. Again, like, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And as we kind of like wrap up this flashback, Deglin, as he's leaving, tosses Vesemir like two or three coins for helping out of a huge bag that the Lord had given him. Um, And I think makes a comment about like, how much do you think your Lord paid for a service like this? And Vesemir asks to go with Deglin, but Deglin notices his hesitation, and he's like, that's the same hesitation that you had with the Mar too, and witchers can't have that. Deglin leaves, and this was the scene that you were talking about, where Vesemir goes back to the home where they stay with all of the servants of the manor, and he sees his father come back, and he makes the decision to follow Deglin on his own. So he takes the honey cake they got from the market and hides it under Ileana's bed and leaves. Um, so this flashback ends with Vesemir going to Kaer Morhen on his own, which I have concerns about, <laughs> <laughs> just in general, which then transitions again to the present day. Yeah, the thing that stood out to me about that was just like, Kaer Morhen's supposed to be a big old secret. Like, how did you find it? How did you know where to follow the trail? And how did you get into the mountains of Caedwen by yourself with what resources, Vesemir? What resources? <laughs> But yeah, all of that aside, he makes it to care more and eventually. <laughs> I think that there's the only explanation because it really bothered me as well that, you know, just a small boy just, uh, hi, <laughs> I'm here. But uh, I think the only explanation I think that can be to justify the whole thing is that maybe because it's, you know, just before the fall of Karen Moran and it will be decades before uh, Geralt says such a thing mm-hmm. that, you know, that Karen Moran is a secret, maybe... It was, you know, more well-known. Maybe there were some advertisements, some maybe signs on the road. <laughs> Come join the witchers! <laughs> yes, exactly. Maybe something like that. I don't know. But it's the only explanation, to be honest. Because, yeah, as you say, it was supposed to be a secret. Unless he, like, really followed Deglin there, but who knows. Yeah, that, that again, that's, I'm the same. That's the only thing that I could think of that just, like, makes sense for uh, this child to have found <laughs> <laughs> this secret witcher fortress uh in the mountains <laughs> that are very dangerous yes yeah, it's, it's the only explanation <laughs> yeah plot armor basically. <laughs> but he makes it that's what's important he makes it after the flashback now an adult vesemir returns to care morin where he meets his fellow witchers and the new recruits and sees a propaganda poster from tetra gilcrest there's this really cool transition of like, you know, Vesemir coming to Kaer Morhen as a child. We then see him looking super proud and very haughty on a horse as he enters Kaer Morhen again. 
he runs into a couple of his fellow witchers, Luca, Sven, who has like a entire cart full of recruits. And then when he's brought in and is speaking with Deglin later, he's reading this poster from Tetra Gilcrest. And the cool thing about this poster is a lot of what's on it actually comes from the books. Um, it comes from, I believe, Flood of Elves from Monstrum. So it says something along the lines of like, witchers are foul and blah, 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 and they suck. <laughs> That's exactly what Sikovsky wrote um, in the original Polish. That's not at all the TLDR. No. <laughs> word for word, that's, that's what it was said in Polish. <laughs> I can confirm that it is exactly what Sikovsky said. Verbatim. <laughs> So he reads this and Vesemir's just like, dude, what is this? Um, and Declan's like, the boys have been finding these posters everywhere. So there's clearly some sort of propaganda and sentiment that's kind of rising through the country. Deglin then tells Vesemir, like, hey, we don't have as many witchers here as we did last year. Everyone's going to have to do their fair share. You're going to teach fencing because we're down two dozen witchers. The interesting thing that Deglin also says is we're down two dozen witchers, not because they died, but because they found more lucrative work, which is really interesting and I think adds a little bit more to his motivations as a character, which we'll see throughout the rest of the film. Um, he also says this really ominous line of, like, a few new beasts would be good for business. <laughs> and he stares <laughs> to the fireplace and it's like really ominous. So after seeing the remnants of an attack by a basilisk, Tetra visits Lady Zerps to try to convince her to appeal to the king to attack witchers. This is like a really short scene. There's like a whole bunch of corpses and she's looking at them and she's analyzing that they must have been from a basilisk. And it turns out that Philavandril is in the crowd briefly and witnesses this before kind of disappearing again. Tetra then goes to Lady Zerbst and threatens her to appeal to the king. So we kind of see that and then we are brought back to Kaer Morin, where Vesemir is teaching fencing to the new recruits. No, it was really well done. And I like the idea of putting a face to the whole propaganda. There is someone, you know, with an emotional, personal connection to the whole thing, the Tetra, because we will later on learn about her motivation, right? So... I believe that in the source material, the message is that the witches were killed mostly because they were different. Mm -hmm. To me, it would be really nice, and it's very poetic, and uh, it tells you everything about the human nature, right? But here, for the audience that doesn't really know the source material, I think that putting someone who's behind it, a uh, proper antagonist, was a good idea, because, uh, yeah, now we have someone that we know exactly why those things happened, and they happened because of someone personally being hurt by witchers. So this was really cool. I like the um, witcher school thing, <laughs> that, you know, we have the adepts brought into the, into the school, it was a really nice thing that Vesemir was like not a very willing teacher. He was just told, okay, so if you want to stay here and, you know, get fed and uh, get lodgings here, you have to do something, be useful somehow. So you'll teach them uh, fencing. And it's really nice because later on we can get a glimpse into Vesemir's more humane side because it seems that even if he tries to be this... Um, really not caring type of a guy, we see that he does care at least enough to be aware that if he gives the young cadets proper instructions on how to wield a sword, they will probably have better chances to survive or so mm -hmm. This was really nicely done. Yeah, yeah um, the propaganda stuff, um, I've literally just remembered that just before that bathtub scene, because it's what the people want. Um, <laughs> there is a dude outside of that tavern that is just shouting nonsense about witches. Yeah. So even then, it's like, you know, we're sort of getting a prelude to how that propaganda is working and, and making its way out there into the world, um, giving the common people uh, this idea or this vision of witches in a negative light. But yeah, it's really cool to see um, Kermoran alive busy and bustling with witches and new recruits coming in and all that sort of thing. Even though Deglin's lost two dozen uh, because of more lucrative work. Right. Again, more foreshadowing. Um, what more do we love in this film is just more foreshadowing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the sort of scene with Tetra as well, as well as more of her just obvious like disgust for witches. There's just a lot of classist nonsense as well going on between her and Lady Ileana. You were married into your position. Tetra very much feels that she's better than a lot of people, I think. Um, not just witches, but also people who are sort of like on her level, like within the council or what have you. 
it's very clear as well. It starts to become very clear that she seems that she would sort of be up to doing anything that she needs to do for her own gain or to get what she wants or needs. Mm -hmm. And we really start to see that with her in this scene, um, which is cool. Um, And then, you know, going forward onto that uh, fencing lesson, you start to, I suppose, see the very early stages of Vesemir becoming the sort of father figure that we see in the end. At the time with that transition starting, I think we start to see him having the sort of mentality of like, well, we can teach you how to be prepared for what's out there. But it sort of comes across in a sort of like, we can teach you how to be your own man, your own lord, uh, rather than work for someone else and by their rules and that sort of thing, which is obviously what Vesemir wanted to do when he was a child. And that's one of the reasons why he left, because he thought he, he deserved better rather than having a life of servitude the whole time. You know, he's become his sort of own boss, as it were. I think he's sort of seeing that um, you can become someone by what we can do here for you at this school. You know, when it comes to Tetra and Lady Zerbst, it's constantly about station and it is very classist. Like she only got her place on the council because her husband died. Um, But since then, you know, she's turned her home into an orphanage and you see all these little children playing outside. And it's clear that Lady Zerbst seems to be like a woman of the people to contrast what Tetra is doing and what she's sowing. I think on that note, it's like we don't really know how long this propaganda has kind of been pushed out into Cadwen. It really is like what I'm assuming like slow moving molasses type propaganda where it's just like (laughs) back in my day, we had to like... (laughs) stand in a town square and just shout slurs into the streets and it's like just fucking get twitter lady i don't know um but it's like (laughs) like for it to ultimately hit the climactic high that it does at the end of the film you know this must have been going on for quite some time even before the events of the film like how long has tetra been holding on to this how long has she been pursuing this goal of eradicating the witchers but it just starts to set the scene like why is she so hell-bent on this i suppose we get a hint of it in what deglin says because he sort of you know says oh a few of the boys have come back with this from the path and you know realistically if you sort of know witcher law you know that for the most part they're out there for the whole year and then they come back to winter You know, you're not told about a timeline for this propaganda, as you said, so we're not sure how long, but you could maybe gather it for the last year at least, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it's still not sort of told at all. Before we get to the rest of the film, we're going to take a break here. Next episode, join me, Rob the Undead Gamer, and Piotr from Witcher School as we continue our discussion of Netflix's anime spinoff film, Nightmare of the Wolf. Thanks for joining us at the breakfast table. For show notes, transcripts of each episode, and a complete list of our social platforms and listening services, head up to breakfastinbeclair.com. Breakfast in Beclair is created by Alyssa from Good Morning. and it's hosted by Alyssa with the Times from Tucson East and by Alyssa from Winterflix. The show is edited by Alyssa with music from Winterfilter Media. Breakfast in Beclair is produced by Alyssa in New York City with Louise of Cover, the owner of the Churlish Porpoise, Kitty the Redhead for Sound, Jacob B. Ava of Gullet Behaven of the Edge of the World, Charlotte the Megabird Glamour, Red Kite, the Original Roach, Cotter and Cat, Libby Claro, Dal Jenny Mandilovich, Wolf Corey from the US, John Brovlia, Tommy from Australia, Joel Kate the Tubby Witch, Ollie from Sweden, James Carson the Third, Kyle the H2 host, Silas Hype Sorcerer, Trevor from the US, and Roxas. Special thanks to Rob and Piotr for joining us for this episode and our international Hansa for their support.